Oh God, I thank you that five, 6,000 kilometers apart or more, and we can still see each other, hear each other, talk, share, pray, read the Bible, explore. You are the creator. And we have done so much damage to what you made. We pray for forgiveness. And we also pray that you might recreate in our lives. Before the second coming, restore our, our, our lives through grace. And we pray you prepare us for the final, ultimate recreation of everything, including ourselves. I pray this is not just science, but I will also help with relationships, how we think about ourselves, and ultimately that we come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Recreate us is our simple prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I see familiar people and new people. Welcome. Let me see if I can share the screen and if she, you can see that. Share. Can you see the word recreation and a chameleon about to eat a little bug? Yeah, beautiful. Wow, what a picture. Oh, that's good. <laughs> are you ready for 140 slides? It'll go fast. Don't worry. Some slides are just one click. Um, but here we go. I don't know if you've ever heard that some cultures thought the world rests on a turtle. I grew up with turtles because I was, I still am, I'm not as much anymore, but allergic to animal hair. And so I grew up with fish and turtles. And there's a, I'm not talking about flat earth today, uh, but there's a joke that a professor went to lecture on the origin of the world through evolution and billions of years. And a lady in the audience said, I don't believe any of that. I think the world rests, sits on a turtle. And the professor being smart said, so what does the turtle rest on? And she said, oh, honey, it is turtles all the way down. You can't go any farther. It's, everything rests on a turtle. Um, it's not just a funny story. If you go to Flor Florence in Italy, Italia, you see some um, artwork. And there is Santa Maria Novella in Giam Bologna, Florence. And the obelisk rests, sits, is balanced on turtles. So we're going to take a look at um, how did the world come about. In uh, Christmas, December 24, 1968, that's the year I was born. Don't, don't add it up, okay? Don't do the math. But uh, um, the Apollo 8 mission from America went to the moon. They were a little poked by the Russians. I've been to that square in Moscow where Yuri Gagarin stands on a big column because he was the first into space and that woke up the Americans and the space race started. But what's interesting is um, NASA, the space agency for the United States said, quote, Frank, we need you to prepare a message to the world. 
We figure that more people will be listening to your voice than that of any other person in history plan to say something appropriate. So that's the ground command telling the astronauts, when you get there, say something important. And uh, some of you might be old enough actually to remember <laughs> what not Frank, but William Anders said. He quoted Genesis chapter one, first Moses book, uh, chapter one, verse one through 10. So out, uh, out of all the things he could have said, he quoted the creation story. Uh, by the way, Apollo is Greek, means de destroy, I destroy. Well, it's a me verb, Apollo me. But it was, to, it was called Apollo to show that the Americans wanted to destroy the boundaries of human limitation. By the way, in America, uh, everybody's talking about Afghanistan and COVID. That's the conversation. And of course, September 11, 2001 right now. When you look at the Hebrew, and I hope that shows up on your computers as Hebrew and, and not uh, reformatted. It says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim et haaretz. When I learned that in Tübingen, Germany, I thought that was a holy moment when I was able to say that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And soon I can say it in Norwegian. But as I said, I'm, I'm going back chapters to learn the pronunciation better. If you look at this first verse, Genesis 1, verse 1, this is how everything starts. There's something interesting. First, it is seven words. Seven is an important number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I colored two things red and two things green. Um, when you look at Genesis 1, verse 1 in Hebrew, there is a hint that we have an intelligent designer, that the world didn't just come out by, by accident or, or Big Bang and here, here's a world. But it's poetic. The first red letters match. You probably don't know Hebrew, but you can see that the red parts are very similar. The little dots at the bottom are just vowels and emphases where to put the pronunciation. And then the green letters looks like an X and, a, and that's a T then, it. Those are direct object markers. They, they look the same as well. So what we have in Genesis 1 verse 1 is a very carefully structured, designed verse to tell us that what the verse is talking about is also very carefully structured and designed. And so are you. Uh, you're not a molecular accident. The verse is carefully designed and the verse what it talks about is carefully designed. So um, then we have uh, the, the earth was without form and void, and that actually rhymes in Hebrew and in German. We actually say that uh, out of Yiddish, probably tohu vavohu. It means chaos. Uh, scholars, of course, uh, debate what, what it actually means. Um, the millennium in Jeremiah 4 is described this way. But when Genesis then says the earth was without form and void in Hebrew, it, it rhymes. Again, intelligent design. My mom, when she came into my room when I was four years old and played with Legos and it was supper time, she would say, was für ein tohu wa wohu in deinem Kinderzimmer. <laughs> what a mess. And she could use that phrase straight out of Hebrew. And then you have this moment. Uh, I'm, I'm very careful how I depict. I don't depict God at all, but how I depict the Holy Spirit or Jesus. But you have the Holy Spirit hovering 
over the waters. Ruach Elohim Merachefet Abne Hayom Hamayim. The the spirit hovering over the waters. The word hovering occurs again, I think, in Isaiah, like an eagle, the royal bird, an eagle hovering over a nest. And then God speaks. I can't wait to read all that in Norwegian. It's it's fascinating to me how that might be worded and written and see how they translated that. I want to see tohu wa wohu. (laughs) <laughs> That's interesting. Tom, yeah. Mm-hmm. Let there be light. Can you imagine the voice of God penetrating the darkness? And he speaks now. And when God speaks... He is um, materializing, (laughs) I don't know if that's a word, particularizing reality. Well, what he speaks becomes reality. Let there be light. Uh, I won't discuss it today just for your brain cells. The light we know, the sunlight, moonlight, stars, electric light, is either made by humans or came on day number four. In German, we, in America, we say four this way. In, a, in Germany, we would say four this way. <laughs> um, that's how spies get caught, little cultural things. Yeah, sun, moon, and stars came on day four. So we now have a light that is not made by humans, and it's before day four. What light is that on day one something to think about uh incredible moment we will get to watch that one day how god recreates and he speaks and reality happens uh just a quick pause i think that is why what we call in english a devotional life is so important because you are spending time with the one who, when he speaks, something happens. You're in direct contact with God and his voice and and speaking, not like he spoke with Moses, unfortunately now, but through his word, the Bible, even then, uh, we are exposing our hearts to the voice of the creator. And so having a devotional life is not just so you're nice, good Christian, and it's the right thing to do, and we should read our Bibles, you are in the presence of the creator. Uh, How how all this happened, difficult to depict, but uh, very fascinating. Uh, Then water, very interesting substance, H2O, uh, space, the idea of space and three dimensions and earth. Uh, This is Lake Tahoe burning right now. Uh, Famous Emerald Bay, my son and I, my son is into photography, my oldest and at 5 a.m., 4.30, I said, let's go. He said, what dad? (laughs) I said, let's go take pictures, okay? Evening and, and early morning is a great time to take pictures. And we were there, it was freezing cold and watching the sunrise over Lake Tahoe in California. A lot of forest fires now, everything burning up. This is around 6 a.m. The sun is coming up now. It's very, very peaceful. In German, we have a book called uh, Morgens um sieben ist die Welt noch in Ordnung. At 7 a.m. in the morning, the world is still okay. After 7, oh, chaotic. Imagine the sun. God is so powerful, he can hold the sun in his hand, form it, make it, speak it, and, and, and put it into the universe. Uh, no big deal. Uh, so hot, so, so big. Uh, 
Incidentally, I, I buy these pictures and videos. They're not stolen off the internet. I subscribe to two image and video services. Um, so copyright is okay. Uh, this, this I took myself in the Philippines out of my hotel room. <laughs> there, there were cracks in the wall where you could see outside and little gecko salamanders came in and out. But a beautiful morning in the Philippines, Mindoro, uh, Occidental Philippines. We were there to preach for four weeks in 2009. <laughs> I took this picture in the backyard of uh, somebody in the Philippines. Uh, just uh, I, I could take God and the Bible completely out of my life, uh, theoretically, and I would still have a difficult time with evolution. Uh, when you look at the beauty and the design of nature, that this cannot just be an accident. Um, it's just hard to imagine just from a humanistic point of view, how, how does this happen? And especially out of a seed, it gets buried in the ground, water, sunshine, and, and then these colors are within the genetics, phytogenetics of, of the plant material. Uh, amazing. I took this in the Philippines as well. That to me looks, it was, it was, it was designed by a German engineer. <laughs> so orderly. And there's ants crawling up and down. But uh, this cannot be an accident. Um, somebody made this. And if the water temperature were a little higher, which is happening now, the fish wouldn't be able to live there. And if it was cooler, the fish couldn't live there. Every, everything works. Uh, sort of now, um, but uh, it's amazing how creation and nature, how everything just works. Look at this insect eye. This I did probably take from Google somewhere. And then you have these caterpillars and they turn into butterflies. There's an important personal lesson, by the way. They make this cocoon, this capsule, and then as they struggle to get out of this capsule, the blood gets forced into the wings of the butterfly. If you open up this capsule by hand with a knife or scissors to help the butterfly come out, he will never fly. It takes this struggle and red light moment in life to squeeze the blood into the wings. If you accelerate the process, and turn the red light green too fast, um, butterfly will not fly. Uh, but the design of these caterpillars, uh, squishy bugs, um, this looks like a spike protein on a virus. <laughs> um, it's, it's just amazing. The design of the eye, uh, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I remember in biology class, in Germany, 12th, 13th grade, the professor, I wanted to go to medical school, and the professor explained that eyes came in evolution through skin layers, uh, ectoderm skin layer, and then there was light and nerve bundles clustered underneath the skin. And because of the light, they kept developing and then they broke through the skin and eye, and eye formed. <laughs> um, that takes a lot of faith and imagination for the evolution of the eye. So complex. And then the creation of human beings. Uh, ladies, I apologize, but we were made out of mud. And that explains some male behavior after sin. Okay, God didn't make a mistake, but... Uh, we revert to mud. And I found my boys, I, I could entertain them for hours with nothing made in China or batteries or, or screens, just a water hose and a pile of dirt outside. And that kept them happy for many hours. 
The structure of the DNA, of course, that's uh, being discussed and debated right now with the mRNA vaccination and what that does to the human body, especially long term, which nobody knows. Uh, I, doctors talk on the whole spectrum of yes, vaccination, not vaccination, but the long term effect, we do not know. Nobody does. But how that is designed and how my son looks like me through DNA is just uh, fascinating. And then also very interesting, scientists say we're closer to pigs DNA-wise than, than monkeys, really. But, but in the evolutionary tree, which I will show you here in a second, we came from monkeys. And then monkeys are a dead-end evolutionary branch now. Monkeys do not develop into humans. It, it looks like when you look at the world, humans develop into monkeys. <laughs> but what's interesting is God speaks and something happens. To create humans, God spoke two or three different times on day number six. The, the speech that created mammals and monkeys is a different act of speaking and creation than the creation of human beings. So from a pure, if you study Genesis point of view, literary structure, God spoke separately to create monkeys, apes, and human beings. And then we have human beings. Uh, this is, uh, I took this in the Philippines as well. <laughs> I bought a violin for a friend of mine from this old man, and he was happy, and we were all happy. Simple people. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female created he them. Not my topic today, maybe another time, very sensitive topic. Uh, also interesting, very specific and explicit, the separation of gender in not only creation, but in the reflection of who we are before God, the image of God knows a gender distinction. The three angels' message in Revelation 14, so important to Seventh-day Adventism and the, the Millerite movement, command number three is worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. We are now at the end of time and I think this is a sign at the end that human culture and civilization and secular philosophy is erasing this part of creation. Everybody is for the environment. We need to save the environment, climate change. The Pope is meeting in Scotland with world leaders in November. Everybody's talking about saving the planet. At the same time, that humanity is erasing gender. I read The Economist last night, cover to cover, and there was an article how this affects language too. Uh, for example, people no longer want to be called he or she. In fact, I received a business card from a chaplain colleague one time, and it said on that card, pronouns, she. Um, then other colleagues, pronouns, they. They don't want to be called he or she. They, they, one person, want to be called they. So we are erasing the image of God as male and female. Um, speaking out about such issues cost John the Baptist his life. He addressed Herod. And his wife, they were living in adultery. They, they'd gotten married. It's a long story, a lot of Herods in the New Testament, but he had drawn away the wife of his brother to himself and addressing moral issues in culture, sent John the Baptist into jail and to the death penalty. And it's the commandment close to the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment. Okay. Speaking up about the Ten Commandments in a Non-commandment culture will eventually lead to the death penalty. Um, I took this with my boys and my wife, this picture several years ago. Uh, we went hiking 
on a Sabbath afternoon, Saturday afternoon, um, and had fun. We saw a snake and found a cave and climbed through the woods. And, and then on the way home, my son said, look, Daddy, look at the sky. It was sunset Saturday evening, and an airplane had put a cross into the sky. Beautiful. And we stood there and watched the sunset together. Take a look at all the creation days. Yeah, we're doing it. I'm keeping an eye on the clock. There's day one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there is day number seven. And when you take a close look at those seven days, let me see if I have it. No, I don't. I thought I had another slide on this. Um, what did God create on day number one? Light. As a bit of a mystery what God actually created on day number one, because the actual lights as we know them, come on day number four, but watch this, day number one and day number four match. Light and then luminaries, objects to, to carry light, sun, moon, and stars on day number four. Day number two is water and sky arrangement. And you have day number five, birds put into the sky and fish in the water. I like to go walking every day, and I'm fascinated by the fear in creation of human beings. And my neighbor's cows, some of them, I can walk up to them and pet them. They're not scared of me. But the fish in the lake that my neighbor has, they swim away. Even though I'm not jumping in the water, I don't want to catch them, and I don't want to eat them. Same with birds. They're up in the tree. Uh, a hawk, beautiful hawk. And I'm a half a kilometer away and I show up in an opening and the hawk flies away, even though I could never reach him. So there's a, a fear because of sin embedded in nature. Um, day number three, you have trees. The earth produces trees. And then day number six, you have animals and people separate acts of creation in day number six. So what God did in creation week, he didn't just randomly say, let's do this, let's do that. Any order, no, it's very planned, very orderly, intelligent design and not uh, coincidence. Also interesting, and then I'll move on, our diet, a plant-based diet is embedded in the week of creation. I think that is why a plant-based diet is so powerful in disease prevention, reversing diabetes, uh, heart attack, stroke, cancer. Um, we still live in a sinful world, but what we are supposed to eat is already prescribed in the creation week. And then the crowning act of creation is woman and Sabbath. So uh, intelligent design speaks of an intelligent designer and I think an intelligently designed document. And I find Genesis 1, 2, and 3, uh, the first three, three chapters of the Bible really explain everything about life and death and marriage and relationships and diet and Sabbath and stewardship and how we take care of the earth and how God loves us. Man was made in Hebrew. Woman was designed, fashioned. I mean, the, the care that went into our existence is uh, just amazing. Moses book, chapter one, two, and three. Uh, I'm going to quote some Ellen White. I, I don't know how you think about Ellen White, but these are just powerful statements. And if you are against Ellen White, listen to them anyway, because she wrote the same time that Charles Darwin became popular. They, they wrote the same time. And so these quotes are not just, well, Adventist Church has Ellen White and they quote Ellen White and they should be quoting the Bible. L listen to these quotes thinking that evolutionary theory is coming up again really old Greek thinking, but 
It's coming up again right at the same time that the Adventist church is born. Very interesting. Not a coincidence. Okay. All right. Patriarchs and prophets. I, I don't have the quote in Norwegian, Danish, or Swedish, uh, or German, just English. So patriarchs and prophets says on the seventh day, man is to refrain from labor in commemoration of the creator's rest. Now think about that. That makes Sabbath anti-atheistic. You, do you understand what I'm saying? When you're resting on Sabbath, seventh day, you are participating in the rest that God rested from or in, in Genesis. And that means you're coming back to the one who made you. And therefore, Sabbath functions as an antidote to atheism. Every seventh day, every week, not once a year, every week, God says, remember me. Look at creation, but come to me. And that is the step the world is missing in climate change. I recycle, I recycle aluminum. Kitchen scraps go in the compost pile and in the garden. I take metal to a metal recycling plant here in town. I love doing that. But I'm noticing the world is, is trying to take care of creation, but ignoring the creator. All right. Uh, here are a couple of scientific quotes from famous people. Very interesting cause and effect, the idea of causality. Here's Albert Einstein. I have to see if I can move myself over here. Here it is, Albert Einstein. Um, the scientist is possessed by the sense of universal causation. B is caused by A. His religious feeling takes the form of a rapturous amazement at the harmony of natural law, which reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. You have to read that twice, uh, even if you're a native English speaker. Uh, I, I'm not making Albert Einstein a creationist uh, by any means, but I find it interesting that even the, he recognized, you look at reality and see the causation, um, there's, there's more and there's an intelligence behind it, whatever that intelligence is. If you move the earth a little farther away from the sun, we would freeze. You move the earth closer, we would burn. The fact that we're at the right distance, um, it's, it's just fascinating. Why? Is that just a coincidence? Um, gravity, the sun provides our food, plan, photosynthesis. Uh, just, just amazing. Stephen Hawking, I think you've probably heard of him. He's passed away now, but he was a physicist in the wheelchair. The law, he says, the laws of science as we know them at present contain many fundamental numbers like the size of the electric charge of the electron and the ratio of the masses of the proton and the electron. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers, see, now listen to this, English language, that's passive voice, seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. What is passive voice doing? Passive voice avoids naming the actor of an action. The ball was thrown at me. Um, Olaf threw the ball at me. The ball was thrown at me. Passive says, I don't want to say that it was Olaf. Is it good for me to use the word name Olaf? I had a friend named Olaf in Germany. So, uh, again, I'm not making Stephen Hawking a believer or a creationist or anything, but, but he admits that the way reality works is not just a pure physical accident. Um, 
when when Stephen Hawking died, I developed a sermon for a scientifically minded uh, teenager in my church and preached a whole sermon on Stephen Hawking and the origin of the universe. Maybe another time. There, there is how reality works at the bottom level, and that's how we exist. I have some powerful quotes for you, and uh, hang in there. The warnings of the word of God regarding the perils surrounding the Christian church belong to us today. As in the days of the apostles, men tried by tradition and philosophy to destroy faith in the scriptures, so today... By the pleasing sentiments of higher criticism, which I apologize, came out of Germany. Evolution, spiritualism, theosophy, theosophy, and pantheism. The enemy of righteousness is seeking to lead souls into forbidden paths. Acts of the Apostles, page 474. Now, this is how this all started. It did not start with uh, Charles Darwin. And I wrote an article with Dr. Art Chadwick, geologist at Southwestern Adventist University uh, in the Adventist Review. I think it was around 2010. Uh, he wrote what happened on earth in 1844 and I wrote what happened in heaven in 1844. Right, here's, here's how it started really. James Hutton, 1788. He wrote an, a theory that spoke against a flood theory and he says the present is key to the past. What's, what's the big deal about that? Well, that means we can only understand and explain reality based on what we can observe right now, which makes what impossible? A seven-day creation, according to Genesis. We cannot observe that. We cannot explain it. Uh, we, so he's saying, forget Genesis. We only judge reality scientifically based by what we can observe right now. Then he wrote a theory of the earth, 1795, and he concluded there's no beginning, there's no end, but that means infinity. Uh, he says in that book, page 166, if the succession of worlds is established in the system of nature, it is in vain to look for anything higher in the origin of earth, like creation. The result, therefore, of our present inquiry is that we find no evidence, vestige, evidence of a beginning, no prospect of an end. If you don't have Genesis, a, a starting point with God, then you no longer have a second coming of Jesus Christ. Nature will just continue to develop um, the way we observe it now. George Cuvier, French uh, scientist, he came up with evolutionary sedimentology. The layers like in the Grand Canyon is a sign of evolution. And then we have Robert Chambers, mid-October 1844. If, if you've been around Seventh-day Adventist, does that date ring a bell? Uh, he wrote a book called The Vestigious Evidence of the Natural History of Creation. The Natural History of Creation. And there's a physicist named Sir David Brester. He wrote, there's a fair chance of poisoning the fountains of science and zapping the foundations of religion. The idea that creation came about naturally would ruin, of course, previous science or, and the idea of creation. Uh, James Secord in Chicago wrote, how did evolution gain this pivotal role in the public arena? The answer turns out to have little to do with Darwinian biology or Big Bang astronomy. Instead, the critical period is the first half of the 19th century. That's 1800 forward. Just when the Millerite movement and Adventism is born. And the turning point is the response of readers to that book I just read from Vestiges. Uh, this is not Darwin yet. This is Charles Lyell, Principles of Geology. And he said, when we observe nature, we can see natural processes and uniformitarianism. What we observe, we can explain. And then came the famous, oops, my water is not moving. Oh, well. The, the famous voyage by Charles Darwin. 
that would be a fascinating voyage, not for vacation reasons, but to re-enact and retrace on a boat. Uh, his captain was Robert Fitzroy. And here is Darwin leaving England, going all the way to South America, then Galapagos Islands coming back around via Australia, Mauritius, and then back up home to England. And on that journey, he observed especially the beaks, sharp point of birds, and the variation. And based on that variation, he came to the conclusion that nature came about through evolutionary processes, and we can observe that process in the variation, micro variation of these bird beaks. I, I've read the book Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, and I always thought not to be mean or uh, obnoxious creationist, but just reading it, I thought he's putting an intelligence into nature that in nature doesn't have. Uh, we recognize the variation, but it seemed to me Charles Darwin assumed that a plant can think and say, donkeys are eating me. Let me make my spikes longer so the donkey won't eat me. And then a thousand years later, the spikes on the cactus are longer in Texas. And now the donkeys don't eat the cactus. Uh, it's just an assumed intelligence. That's hard to understand to, for me. Origin of species. Um, just something interesting. Whenever you deal with people, you're dealing with people. Okay, that was deep. Uh, theologians, scientists, they're, they're still human beings and they all have a personal history. And I want to show you something in the next slide here after this one. Charles Darwin originally published his Origin of Species, 1859. The Great Controversy came out in 1858. And Eva, I have somebody you should invite, uh, Oleg Lotka from streamsoflight.net. He has an ambitious plan, young man, he preached in our church yesterday, to distribute the great controversy to every home in North America. This book right here. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the great controversy, the, the number one book explaining life from start to finish and what is happening spiritually in the world, came one year before the number one book promoting evolutionary theory. Same time frame. But since I'm a pastor too, I can't just look at it scientifically. And here's something interesting. Charles Darwin had a little girl, four years old, named Annie, who got very sick and died. And I've learned that behind every theology, is biography. What do I mean by that? But behind our thinking, our theoretical thinking, our philosophy, our theology, what we say about God, there's also a human story behind that. It's not just pure thinking. There's pain and, and sin and suffering behind it. And so Charles Darwin wrote one time after he lost uh, Annie, too early, little girl. Charles Darwin, quote, I've never been an atheist in the sense of denying the existence of God. An agnostic would be the most correct description of my state of mind. Charles Darwin used to go to church. And then Annie died and he quit going to church, which is a very normal, common reaction when you lose a child. It's, according to psychologists, the highest stress factor in a family loss of a child. Ranks higher than a divorce. And he, like many people, could not reconcile how a loving God could allow such a painful experience to happen. Well, why would a four-year-old child have to die? And so some of his reaction philosophically is based, I think, on psychology. Then came William Miller, and uh, ironically, 1844 was the key time. 1842 is when his research really started, and Charles Fitch 
came up with this chart that the early Adventists used. But it's no coincidence that we have these two train tracks, 1844 Advent movement, three angels message, and, and evolutionary theory, same time. Um, of course, uh, evolution has um, poked, prodded Christianity for the last 100 years. Here's the famous Scopes trial when a teacher wanted to teach evolution as well, not just creationism, famous Scopes trial, 1925. And the offense defense attorney for the teacher says, quote, out of court, uh, in America, I don't know how it's in Europe, but if you make a statement in court, then the other side has the right to make a statement in court as well, okay? defense and prosecution. And so this defense attorney made the statement outside of court so the other side couldn't immediately respond. But Clarence Darrow says, you insult every man of science and learning in the world because he does not believe in your fool religion, creationism. We have the purpose of preventing bigots and ignoramuses, Latin word, from controlling the education of the United States. So now creation versus evolution is not just a scientific discussion. It is now becoming a great controversy that affects mainstream culture and what is being taught in biology class in America. I saw this Time magazine, that was uh, October 9, 2006, how we became humans. Chimps and humans share almost, monkeys, chimps, 99% of their DNA. New discoveries reveal how we can be so alike and yet so different. Uh, this is a bus in London, England, and I think that was sponsored by Richard Dawkins, famous evolutionist who always likes to make fun of Christians. There's probably no God, period. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. <laughs> they got it wrong. There is a God, Matthew 6. Now stop worrying and live a life of service, which is the greatest joy in life. So they missed it. Uh, here's Richard Dawkins. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. Then Christopher Hitchens' famous book, God is Not Great, The Case Against Religion. Uh, that is a pun on Christianity because we have a hymn called How Great Thou Art. And so God is not great. It's a direct hit against Christianity. Then Richard Dawkins wrote The Greatest Show on Earth, um, Evidence for Evolution. Uh, this is an interesting one, The Lost World of Genesis 1, Ancient Cosmology and the Origins Debate. Um, the, Walton argues that since we have other cultures with a seven-day creation or a creation story, maybe Genesis borrowed from other cultures. And I actually sat down with a scientist uh, over lunch one time, and he said, you know, creation is fine. What he thinks happened is a zoological burst 40,000 years ago. And in those 40,000 years, God took seven days back then, not to start life or creation, but to order creation and, and change it into a different react, re, direction. That is really theistic evolution. Uh, God is involved, but not the way Genesis describes it. I would say uh, is a classic correlation does not equal causation fallacy. What I mean by that is just because other cultures have creation stories or scientists see this zoological burst 40,000 years ago, um, that doesn't mean that Genesis borrows from that. And therefore we need to read Genesis through the eyes of evolution and zoological bursts. Here's an example of theistic evolution, Genesis evolution, and the search for a reason faith. Um, I, I won't read the whole paragraph. I just read the bold print. Um, readers will learn that they need not to choose religion over science or faith over reason. 
and that evolution does not threaten, but rather enriches faith. So that's a, another philosophy that you don't have to put aside the Bible. Science, evolution, and Bible can coexist. We're just reading Genesis wrong. But that's problematic because then Sabbath has no longer any meaning. For the last time, stop following me. I'm a creationist. I can't see you. Let me move you back over closer. There you go. It's a little fuzzy, but I thought that's interesting how evolutionists think about us. Here are the facts. What conclusion can we draw from them? That's the scientific method. And then they say the creationist method is here's the conclusion. What facts can we find to support it? And they're probably uh, ridiculing everybody who's not getting the vaccination the same way. We already made our conclusion. Let's find some facts. Uh, I had something funny happen. I don't know if it's funny or not. Um, I was in biology class and uh, uh, I didn't, I was a fresh baked Christian. I was not educated on evolution and creation. I didn't know how to deal with it. But somebody told me that a man looked up to heaven and told God, we don't need you anymore. We can create life in the lab. We don't need God. And God said, okay, out of heaven, show me. And the man went outside, picked up a handful of dirt. And God said, uh, stop, stop, stop. That's my dirt. <laughs> you can't use that. I made that. But here's my biology professor up top, Dr. Nagelschmidt, tall guy. And then over on the right side with the red circle, Mr. Biter. That was my English professor uh, in Stuttgart, Feuerbach, Germany. And I remember the day when Dr. Nagelschmidt described a great respect for the man, uh, how, how everything started. I remember the day I was sitting there and I didn't know much about evolution creation, but I was a fresh baked Adventist. And he said uh, there was a pool of amino acids, protein matters, proteins denature in an uncontrolled environment. And, and it's bubbling and uh, it, it evolved into life. And, and I raised my hand. I said, doctor, that, that requires faith. That, that's a lot of assumptions. We are guessing scientifically, scientific method, about something that happened billions of years ago that we cannot reproduce in a lab. Okay. We still can't produce artificial blood. Maybe one day we can, but we're, we're poking scientifically absolutely in the dark. Okay. These are hypotheses, theories. Uh, in Dallas, uh, where I live, well, I live an hour away in the country, but um, a famous man, Ross Perot, rich oil man, built this museum, and it's all based on evolution. And in that museum, I thought there was something funny. They, they showed this tree of life, how everything developed and the different strands. And there's another tree for the monkey and the humans and all that. But I, I'm, I'm not making this up. I traced back spiders and annelids, mollusks and roundworms, flatworms all the way. And at the very bottom, it says life. <laughs> you're in an evolutionary museum and it shows you how life came about. And when you trace it back to the very origin of life, it just says life, which means life came from life. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> that, 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 was, that was funny. Here's uh, Pope John Paul II, Karol Wojtyla from Poland. He, he was uh, part of a big study on this creation evolution debate in Christianity. And he wrote, Humani generis, the origin of humans, considered the doctrine of evolutionism as a serious hypothesis worthy of a more deeply studied investigation and reflection on a par with the opposite hypothesis, uh, creationism. Now watch this. On October 23, 1996, 
Okay, October 23, important date in Adventism. He says, today, more than half a century after this encyclical, new knowledge leads us to recognize in the theory of evolution more than a hypothesis. The convergence neither sought nor induced of results of work done independently one from the other, they, they, they always have this convoluted language, constitutes in itself a significant argument in favor of this theory. What is he saying in plain Norsk? He is saying the theory of evolution makes more sense to the Catholic Church in explaining the origin of life than the Genesis creation account. The Catholic Church officially states we side with evolution. Um, this theologian recently passed away, Hans Küng. I have met him in person. Uh, Swiss German theologian. He was Catholic, but then got kicked out of the priesthood uh, for his ecumenical ideas. He started an ecumenical center in Tübingen, wrote many books, and he's quoting a man named Karl Schmitz Moorman. And this is from Hans Küng's book, Credo, uh, page 21. Listen to this. The notion of the traditional view of redemption as reconciliation and ransom from the consequences of Adam's fall. And I'll read that twice. The idea that Adam fell through sin, then death came in, and we need to be redeemed from this sin and death that was started in the Garden of Eden. He says, is nonsense. For anyone who knows about the evolutionary background to human existence in the modern world. Uh, these scholars, you always, I have to read them twice to wrap my mind around what they're saying. But they're saying, if you know about evolution, death did not come from sin. That there's always been death. There's life and death, life and death. Sin did not cause death. And therefore, to be redeemed from sin... To be redeemed from death makes no sense. The death on the cross, the second coming, doesn't matter because sin did not cause death. Death is just part of life, ironically. Amazing statement. So if you believe in creation and Genesis 1, you believe in nonsense. <laughs> Here's Jacques Monod, a French Nobel Prize winner of biology. He says, man knows, and he's right. If you believe in evolution, this statement is correct. Man knows at last that he's alone in the universe's unfeeling immensity out of which he emerged only by chance. His destiny is nowhere spelled out, nor is his duty. That's right. If you don't have the Bible, don't believe in creation. You're just a molecular coincidence. That's all you are. No purpose, no origin, no in no plan. Uh, how are you doing, poor listeners? A <laughs> lot of information. Um, Ellen White counters all this, and then she comes around. I probably need another 20, 30 minutes, but we can also pause and continue another time. What she does is she gives a counter theory. Okay. And then explains how this affects our personal lives on Monday morning. This is not just creation, evolution, philosophically, we're thinking about big stuff, can't understand half of it. This will affect your personal life. You, you're still okay? We yeah. are okay. Good. <laughs> Look at this. So we have this massive movement flooding our culture worldwide. Communism, atheism, secularism, Everybody's evolution. Public high schools, evolution. Medicine, science, evolution. Now comes this little lady, third grade education, and counters this worldwide movement. She says in volume four, Testimonies, page 274, the great object in the establishment of our college was to give correct views of science and Bible religion. So she's saying we shouldn't have just colleges to make nice little Christian students. 
we are countering the number one philosophy that is overshadowing the world scientifically. Amazing. That's our school system, the Adventist school system. Um, here's another one, Review and Herald, March 1, 1898. We need to guard continually against the sophistry in regard to geology and other branches of science, falsely so-called, which have not one semblance of truth. The theories of great men need to be carefully sifted of the slightest trace of infidel suggestions. One tiny seed sown by the teachers, by teachers in our schools, if received by the students, will raise a harvest of unbelief. And we have had this conflict in some of our schools where some of our teachers introduced doubt in the Genesis record and doubt in the creation account and introduced that theistic evolution at least makes more sense than Genesis creation. Fundamentals of education, there will be an effort made on the part of many pretended friends of education to divorce religion from the sciences in our schools. She's not writing against science. She said, we need to teach science, but from the viewpoint of the Bible. Uh, Dr. Chadwick here in Texas, he's world famous for what's called mega trends in North American paleo currents. He's developed a flood model. Um, the basic explanation would be you take a drop of water and let it fall on the earth. He has observed that that drop of water will not land neutrally, but will either go right or left be because of curvature, gravity, it will go towards the Pacific or the Atlantic. There's a tilt. And if you exponentially um, multiply water drops in a computer model, you can recreate a flood model that will then explain the Grand Canyon and sedimentary evidence in earth layers. Very fascinating. Uh, I thought if there are kids, I have one quote on dinosaurs, that, that man right there is me. Uh, yeah, Ellen White mentions dinosaurs once or twice, not too much, but she says, uh, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, 121, there were a class of very large animals which perished at the flood. God knew that the strength of man would decrease and these mammoth animals could not be controlled by feeble man. So yeah, the dinosaurs died with the flood. Now the spiritual aspect of all this. Uh, there's a man named Mark Noel. He wrote a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. How, how evangelicals have reduced thinking to Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, but we have surrendered the philosophical conversation in the world to secularism. And he has a quote in there. He's not a Seventh-day Adventist, but he has a quote in his book that says, page 13, a popular belief known as creationism, a theory that the earth is 10,000 or less years old, has spread like wildfire in our century from its humble beginning in the writings of Ellen White. The founder of Seventh-day Adventism to its current status is a gospel truth embraced by tens of millions of Bible-believing evangelicals and fundamentalists around the world. Uh, we say 6,000 years, but I know that's debated. But it's interesting, a non-Adventist recognizes that the counter-movement to evolutionary theory came from Ellen White. Yeah. Uh, she says, I was then carried back to the creation and was shown that the first week in which God performed the work of creation in six days and rested on the seventh day was just like every other week. The great God in his days of creation and day of rest measures, measured off the first cycle as a sample for successive weeks till the close of time. The this, this seven-day pattern is established. The unbeliever supposition, infidel, that the events of the first week required seven vast indefinite periods for their accomplishment strikes directly at the foundation of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. It makes 
definite and obscure that which God has made very plain. There are some churches that say that the seven days of creation are 1,000-year periods. Ellen White says, it is the worst kind of infidelity and is an impeachment of his wisdom. This creation evolution debate was important to our founding fathers and mothers. I've been shown, it's not just her opinion, she says, I've been shown that without Bible history, geology can prove nothing. But when men leave the word of God in regard to the history of creation and seek to account for God's creative works upon natural principles instead of Genesis 1, they are upon a boundless ocean of uncertainty. Just how God accomplished the work of creation in six literal days, he has never revealed to mortals. <clears throat> his creative works are just as incomprehensible as his existence. Now, this is an amazing quote. Man, man will be left without excuse. The computer is covering up. Zoom is covering up the first line. God has given sufficient evidence upon which to base faith if we wish to believe. Listen to this. We are in the last days. Here's why. In the last days, the earth will be almost destitute of true faith. Upon the merest pretense, the word of God will be considered unreliable, while human reasoning will be received, though it be in opposition to plain scripture facts. Men will endeavor to explain from natural causes the work of creation, which God has never revealed. She is saying, to explain the origin of life based on natural causes against scripture is a sign that we're living in the last days. Here we are. That's a direct hit, I would say. Human science cannot search out the secrets of the God of heaven and explain the stupendous works of creation, which were a miracle of almighty power any sooner than it can show how God came into existence. And don't misunderstand this quote. She's not saying God came into existence. She's saying since we cannot show that God came into existence because he didn't, we also cannot explain fully the works of creation. Ministry of Healing, the, I'm reading the book Ministry of Healing with my wife every night, Ministry of Healing, 2021. <laughs> the work of creation cannot be explained by science. What science can explain the mystery of life? Where were you, God? Asked Job. When I laid the foundations of the earth. Now, this is personally important now. Red light, green light. It's not a cold-hearted God that tells Job that. God is telling Job, since you cannot explain how life came about, how I created the world, you will not always understand suffering on this earth. Your red lights, if, if you remember my last sermon talk, your red lights don't always have a cause effect explanation. You have to wait till the end is God's message. And in the end, for the book of Job, God restores everything Job lost. Uh, in the creation of the earth, God was not indebted to pre existing matter. He spoke and it was. He commanded it stood fast. All things natural, material, spiritual stood up before the Lord Jehovah at his voice. And were created for his own purpose, the heavens and the host, all the host of them, the earth and all things there, and came into existence by the breath of his mouth. So no theistic evolution, no pre-existing matter necessary. God spoke, and it was. The deepest students of science, and notice she's not saying ignore science, throw it away, let's not study science. No, she says the deepest students of science are constrained to recognize in nature the working of infinite power, but to man's unaided reason, nature's teaching cannot be but contradictory and disappointing. Only in the light of revelation can it be read aright through faith. We understand book called education. <laughs> I had a Bible study group at, at my university, and I invited all the faculty Thursday during lunch to come and read the book Education together. One colleague showed up. One. Then two. 
and then three, and then two. It was a very small group. <laughs> if you teach, you must read the book Education. Uh, Jesus confirms the creation story when he says, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? So Jesus assumes that the creation story is accurate, an accurate depiction of reality in the creation of Adam and Eve. Um, I have a few more slides, not too many. We got time. John chapter one in Greek, not Hebrew. When John writes his gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke had already been written. Most scholars think, I, I think so too, looks like. And John came later. So John is saying, I'm writing a gospel to a new generation. They don't have Jesus physically present. The, the apostles are dying out. Um, the early eyewitnesses are disappearing. We need to record in writing what happened because the next generation will have to rely on reports, not on eyewitnesses. And he designed his gospel as a book of Genesis based on the ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, what am I saying is, John is saying, when you accept Jesus Christ and his ministry into your life, an event will take place as big, uh, the size, the magnitude of the original Genesis creation. Why? Because you're accepting the creator of the universe into your life. Ephesians 3, 9, the father created through his son. Ellen White says the father had a, a co-worker, an agent through whom he created. And so when, when you accept the gospel, John is saying, your life will be restored the way it was in the Garden of Eden before sin. And that's why he says in his gospel, in the beginning was the word. What is John trying to do? He's saying, we've messed everything up. Everything in our lives are broken. You have Jesus in your life. We will turn back the clock to the original creation and will make the gospel sound like the creation event. In the beginning was the word. In Greek, en arche en hologos. In the beginning was the word. And that's why I call this recreation. Uh, science, evolution, it's all interesting. It's a great controversy. But here's where it affects me on Monday morning, my personal life. Education page 126. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise accepted by the will received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. See, you're accepting God into your life. You're accepting the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and there it is, recreates the soul in the image of God. What God did in the original creation through the gospel of Jesus Christ, he wants to accomplish again on a spiritual level in your life. Amazing. And here's how he did that. Adam uh, was put into a garden. He was created on a Friday and he sinned at a tree. Okay, Adam and Eve eating the fruit. Then as a result of the curse, disobedience, he received thorns, book of Genesis. To live, he received the breath of life. God says in Genesis 1, 31 and 2 verse 1, it is finished. And Adam is put into paradise. Now watch what happens on the cross. You have Jesus, the second Adam, is in a garden praying for the salvation of the world. He dies on a Friday. He receives a crown of thorns on his head, saying, I'm swallowing up the curse from the Garden of Eden, and I'm taking it upon myself. 
He gives up his breath and Luke, the doctor, observes that. Uh, Luke in Greek says he exhaled a last time and died. Jesus on the cross says it is finished, just like in creation. And Jesus on the cross, Luke 23, verse 43, uh, yes, 43, tells the thief on the cross, I promise you, you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is a rare term. And the thief on the cross asked to be in the kingdom of God. <laughs> what does Jesus promise? He promises paradise, which is the kingdom. But, but Jesus very intentionally on the cross is telling a, a lost sinner who's confessing his sins and turning towards Jesus, I will put you back in paradise and everything will be restored. So what Jesus is doing on the cross is he's, He's undoing the curse and hinting at a future total recreation of our lives. And that is why um, Jesus is called the second Adam. Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Romans 6, 4, baptism. Therefore, I baptized somebody yesterday. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too, so we too, as Christ, so the Christian may walk in a new way of life. Desire of Ages, page 824, the very essence of the gospel is restoration, recreation. So he wants to give us a new heart, uh, Signs of the Times, August 21, 1893, that he might recreate, my title, the image of God. On the other hand, you have Satan, Ministry of Healing 113, sickness and suffering and death are work of an antagonistic power. Satan is the destroyer. God is the restorer. Um, Gospel Workers 286, the spirit recreates, refines, and sanctifies human beings. I don't have a lot more, just a few more. Yeah, we got time. Huh? The old nature. Now, now, here's where it affects you. Right? This is not just theory, theory of evolution. No, watch this. The old nature, that's you, me, born of blood and the will of the flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The old ways, the hereditary tendencies, the former habits must be given up. For grace is not inherited. The new birth consists in having new motives, new tastes, new tendencies. I hope you speak English well enough or understand English well enough. I used to have this misspelled accidentally, and I would read the new birth consists in having new movies. <laughs> new movies. <laughs> and college students, they would look up and smile at me or roll their eyes. <laughs> As a Christian, you can no longer watch what you used to watch. You can't eat what you used to eat, smoke like you used to smoke, drink. You're becoming a new creation. You're a new person. Those who become new creatures in Christ will bring forth the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. They will no longer, steps to Christ, fashion themselves according to the former lusts, but by the faith of the Son of God. They will follow in his steps, reflect his character, purify themselves even as he is pure. I think that's 1 John 3, verse 3. The things they once hated, they now love. Broccoli, salad, water. And the things they once loved, they hate. You're a new creation. The proud and self-assertive become meek and lowly in heart. The vain and, and proud and, and boasting people, supercilious become serious and unobtrusive. The drunken becomes sober. That's the power of the gospel. You are a new creation. You're no longer drunk. Okay. And the profligate, um, pure, the vain customs and fashions of the world are laid aside. The Holy Spirit comes to the soul, is of ages 391, as a comforter. By the transforming agency of his grace, the image of God is reproduced in the disciple. There it is complete restoration and recreation. He becomes a new creature. Love takes the place of hatred and the heart receives the divine similitude, comparison, likeness. Second Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, look, 
He is a new creation. Um, this can change your marriage. Marriage and the Sabbath had their origin, twin institutions for the glory of God and the benefit of humanity, like every other one of God's gifts and trust to the keeping of humanity. Marriage has been perverted by sin, but it is the purpose of the gospel to restore, recreate its purity and beauty. So the, the theory of evolution versus creation then comes down on your the level of your personal life. Gentlemen, men, if you're married, listen to this. Mount of Blessing 65, now is in Christ's day, the condition of society presents a sad comment upon heaven's ideal of his, this sacred relation through the surrender of the soul to God, his wisdom can accomplish what human wisdom fails to do. Through the revelation of his grace, hearts that were once indifferent or estranged may be united in bonds that are firmer and more enduring than those of earth, the golden bonds of a love that bear the test of trial. Um, there was a Presbyterian theologian, uh, three hours from me, he had cancer, and he wrote a book, I'm not an Adventist, no Ellen White, no Sabbath. And he realized that the phrase cross and resurrection is insufficient. As he's struggling with cancer, he realized it is cross. The gospel is cross, Sabbath, and resurrection. And he wrote a book. He's passed away now, but it's called Between Cross and Resurrection, A Theology of Holy Saturday. Why is that so important? Because Sabbath embraces creation Friday when we were made, and it looks forward to our recreation. And that is why we Adventists have a three angels message. Five more minutes or less. We use a Greek New Testament in seminaries around the world. This is uh, the fifth revised edition. It's printed in Stuttgart, Germany, where I grew up. Deutsche Bibelgesellschaft. And it's, it's put together by scholars who I don't know if they believe. I don't know if they care. I don't know if they've ever heard of Adventists or Ellen White or drink beer and smoke cigars. But these scholars looked at Revelation 14, 7, and they put a footnote with Revelation 14, verse 7. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now, this is amazing. This, this is my Greek Bible that I used to use. And there I'm pointing at digital finger, pointing at the footnote the scholars put with Revelation 14, verse 7. I don't know if you can see it, but it says Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. These are secular beer drinking German uh, Jesuit Greek scholars who recognized that the, the background to the call to creation in Revelation 14, verse 7, is the Sabbath commandment. And you can see the red ink here, the parallel, that Revelation 14, 7 borrows directly from the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. So that is why our three angels message includes the Sabbath commandment. And that is why Mark of the Beast and all that will have to do with countering this last message by those three angels. <clears throat> One day, um, God will use the oil reserves in the earth um, to burn the earth and start over. At the end of the 1,000 years, he will call forth the fires in the earth as his weapons, which he has reserved for the final destruction. And fire came down out of heaven, devoured them. And God uses fire then to cleanse the earth and make everything new. Like this. The entire world on fire. And I'm wondering, uh, these fires in California, if they are a precursor, a warning. Humans, this is what's coming. Uh, God doesn't want destruction. Uh, these are caused by Satan, destruction, great controversy. But 
he's using these isolated, localized destructions. Greece, Turkey was on fire last few weeks to warn us life is short. There's a limit to human life and uh, we will not always be on this earth. He has to destroy it in order to recreate it. I'm having fun with these fires, but uh, they are destructive and cause great harm and pain and suffering. But I noticed a pattern in the Bible from the flood. And you can read the entire Bible cover to cover. You will find this pattern. When there is destruction, God uses destruction to recreate. Satan destroys to destroy. Uh, he, he just makes everything in German kaput. Everything broken. And then he laughs. People suffering. God uses destruction. I'm not saying causing, but God is using destruction to rebuild. And we have that in the flood example. And I think he is waiting. His son is waiting to recreate this world and, and start over. Um, we were not meant to suffer like this starvation, pestilence, war. Uh, how great the art. He, he's going to recreate everything one day. And that is my message of recreation. The, the number one philosophical issue that has plagued Christianity over the last century is actually a personal message to come to Jesus as your recreator and start fixing your life. The God who created the world wants to recreate your future. Amen. <laughs> Boy, can, was... you, can you please explain one thing? Uh, when Sister Wise says that the, when God creates the new heaven and the earth, it will be even more beautiful than the first earth when he first created how can something be more beautiful than something perfect in the beginning yes we we think of perfection mathematically on a scale from one to ten and god created the world as a perfect ten but he still put adam and eve into the world to work it how can you work in a world that's already perfect perfection with god is dynamic I, I think perfection, we think as humans, perfection mathematically, once you reach on a scale from one to 10, once you reach a 10, it, you cannot improve upon it. But for God, it's not one to 10. For God, it's 10. And then you can make more 10. We can be fruitful and multiply in a perfect world. We can work the world. And I think it's similar to the experience when you're healthy. And then you break your leg, you have surgery, you have screws in your leg and your bone, you do physical therapy, and the day comes when you can run again. And you are more thankful for your leg now than you were when it was perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. you appreciate that the restoration of, of your leg. Uh, so that, that's how I think of it. Uh, and God, it, it makes sense that God says, let me create a perfect world. We go through this sin mess, disaster. And then God says, when I restore this, I will make it even better. It's, it's not a reflection on the, the early world. First world was not perfect, but God says, I'm creator. I can create even bigger and more. 